Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that once the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa entered the masjid and he saw a man from the Ansar named Abu Umama. So he said to Abu Umama, Ya Aba Umama, ma li araka jalisan fil masjidi fi ghayri waqt salah Oh Abu Umama, why is it that I see you sitting in this masjid at a time that is outside of the prayer time? Fi ghayri waqt salah of course there were people that would sit and do tadabbur and tafakkur, there were people that would do reflection and contemplation, there were people that would engage themselves in remembrance. But Abu Umama looked like he had a lot on his mind, a lot on his heart. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who had enough on his plate, <laughs> adds more to his plate by going and asking people how they're doing. Now that's something, by the way, that should not be missed in this hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you can imagine when he came to the masjid, how much he's carrying. When he leaves the masjid, how much he's carrying. And sometimes you don't ask someone how they're doing because you know you're going to get into a long conversation. You know that this is going to prolong itself. I might regret getting involved because I don't have time to deal with this right now. But our messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam would ask people about them. He would ask about people that were missing and he would ask people that were there, but they seemed to be in a different place, that were physically present, but emotionally, mentally looked like they were somewhere else. So why is it, O oh Abu Umama, I see you in this situation? So he said to the Prophet Sallallahu He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm just overcome with a lot of anxiety and I'm buried in debt too. Qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Afala wa'allimuka kalaman idha anta qultahu adhab Allah Azza wa Jalla hammak wa qada anka daynak the Prophet ﷺ said, let me teach you some words that if you say them on a daily basis in the morning and the evening, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do away with your anxiety and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do away with your debts. Qala qultu bala ya Rasulullah. He said, I said to the Messenger of Allah, yes, O Messenger of Allah. Qala idha asbahta wa idha amsayta. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wa a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal. وأعوذ بك من الجبن والبخل وأعوذ بك من غلبة الدين وقهر الرجال so this is a dua of course that we say often and has different variations of it but the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to say اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الهم والحزن oh Allah I seek refuge in you from anxiety and grief وأعوذ بك من العجز والكسل and I seek refuge in you from inability and from laziness. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْجُبْنِ وَالْبُخْلِ And I seek refuge in you from stinginess and cowardice. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ غَلَبَةِ الدَّيْنِ وَقَهْرِ الرِّجَالِ And I seek refuge in you from the burden of debt and from being subjugated to man, from being at the mercy of someone else other than you, O Allah. Now, Abu Umama continues, قَالَ فَفَعَلْتُ ذَلِكَ فَأَذْهَبَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ هَمِّي وَقَضَى عَنِّي دَيْنِي He said, I did what the Prophet told me, so Allah indeed removed my anxiety and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did away with my debts. And this is a hadith, the dua is authentic across the board. The incident behind it is disputed. However, the dua is undisputed in terms of how uh, authentic it is. But I want to talk about this inshaAllah ta'ala, particularly from the first two sentences. The difference between these words and what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is actually giving to us. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from al-ham, which is anxiety, and al-hazan, which is grief. Al-ham, the scholars say, refers to anxiety over the future. I'm worried about what's going to come next. I'm worried about tomorrow. I'm uncertain about this situation. I don't know how this is going to unfold and that's causing me a great sense of paralysis. Alham. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, Man asbaha wa dunya akbar hamma, whoever wakes up and has dunya, has the world, the life of this world as their greatest hem, their greatest concern, that which causes them great anxiety. Ja'alallahu faqrahu bayna aynay. He has poverty between his two eyes. All he sees is poverty at all times. And so the hem here is not a positive hem. It's not worried about something that is good, but it's rather the anxiety that comes with being uncertain about the future. Al hem. Al hazan is grief and it refers to the past. It refers to a great sense of loss. I can't get out of the pain that I am feeling in the past. And so basically, subhanAllah, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the concern of the future and the burden of the past so that you can be more productive in the present. Because at the end of the day, both of these things paralyze you. They both stop you from being able to move forward. And sometimes we might think that we should feel a sense of guilt for moving on from something. You know, by the way, it's always important to recognize that the shaitan leads you to either unproductive action or to no action at all by giving you good words, right? 
And so how can you move on from the past? You should feel guilty, you should hold yourself to the past and you should not do anything. That is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not praise about a person. You might think that it's a sin that I committed in the past and I can't get over it. And tawbah, regret is repentance, but at the same time, hasra, which is remorse, where a person just sits around and a person says, yeah, hasrata, I messed up, I messed up, I messed up. That's not a praiseworthy quality. And so a person is either stuck in the past or they're way too concerned about the future. And the scholars mention here that when it comes to the past, because you're not just saying these du'as without understanding the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hold you to the sins that you have committed in the past if you repented from them. So if it's a sin that's causing you grief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hold you to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to move forward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want you to be frozen or paralyzed by your past. So if it's sin or something that you've done bad, you need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that's most forgiving. If it is pain that you feel over something that indeed happened to you, then it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that compensates for that pain in the hereafter. The compensation awaits around the corner. If it is regret, that you did not do something differently. You know, sometimes we think I could have done this differently and this wouldn't have happened. So we beat ourselves up over, you know, not having done enough for someone or not having intervened at a certain point or not having done this or not having done that. Then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a plan for that person as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for you. The point is, is that you're not supposed to be frozen by your past, paralyzed by your past, but instead use it, grow out of it and think about that which comes afterwards bi idnillahi ta'ala. And remember that when it comes to the future as a person is so afraid, anxious, uncertain about that which comes next, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed is upon all things in control. That everything is going to unfold in the way that is going to unfold, whether you concern yourself with it or not. But by acting in a way that is praiseworthy, bi ta'ala, the future will hold a positive fate for you. So alham wal hazan, and this is also when the angels come to us when we are dying, alla takhafu wa la tahzanu. Do not be afraid, alla takhafu about the future. When a person is leaving this world, the angels say, Allah takhafu, don't worry about that which comes next, wala tahzanu, and don't grieve over that which you are leaving behind. What's going to happen with their kids? What's going to happen with their spouse? What's going to happen with this person and that person? What's going to happen with all of this? La tahzanu. What's going to happen next? Where am I going? What's the next stage here? At this point, there is no a'mal, there is no actions. La takhafu, don't be afraid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take care of you at this point. So, min al hammi wal hazan, and then I'll just talk about the second one. Min al ajzi wal kasal. This is very powerful because al-ajz and al-kasal often get translated as the same thing. Al-ajz, which is inability, is adam al-qudra ala fi'l al-shay. It is when you don't have the ability to do something. So things are truly out of your control. You're in a situation where you are helpless and you can't do anything about it. And you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, protect me from that. Al-kasal is when you have al-qudra ala shay, you have the ability to do something, but you have a tathaqul, you have a burden, something that's holding you back. You're able, but you're not willing. You can, but you're not. And a lot of times we resign things to al-ajaz that are really just al-kasal. Many of us put things in the domain of we're not able to do it, where the reality is we're not willing to do it. So finding the motivation, finding the willpower to be able to do something. And this is something that we have to remind ourselves that we push ourselves as much as we can. And sometimes the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up for us as a result of His blessing, bi-ithnillah, insha'Allah, by His will, by His permission, are things that we would have never thought we are capable of. Min al-jubni wal-bukhul, cowardice and stinginess. Cowardice is, I restrain myself when I should say something, when I should do something. Al-bukhul is when I don't spend, when I could spend, I'm not generous. I'm paralyzed by a sense of fear of poverty. And then you find ghalabat al-dayni wa qahr al-rijal, to not be burdened by debt or to be at the mercy of another person, to be subjugated by man. Because no one likes to be at the mercy of another human being in any way whatsoever. What I want us to leave with inshaAllah ta'ala, what is the psychological effect of repeating this dua every morning and evening and understanding what it means? Al-ajzi wal-kasal, al-hammi wal-hazan. Reminding yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of the future, so I should not lose myself in uncertainty about it. Reminding yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven what you have done in the past and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow that past to lead to future growth. Reminding yourself not to grieve over it. Reminding yourself 
that you get yourself out of al-ajz, that there are certain things that I cannot control. But oh Allah, forgive me when I can't control the situation and help me overcome those situations. Oh Allah, open up those doors for me. And al-kasal, when it comes to laziness, when a person just does not find the willpower to do anything anymore, when a person shuts down. All of these are deeply complex topics, but the effect of reading this on a morning and evening basis, where you're understanding the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you understand the deep wisdom of these words, are things that can truly transform our lives, and more importantly, can lead to elevation. The hereafter, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from al-hammi wal-hazan. Na'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. Wa na'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal. Wa na'udhu bika min al-jubni wal-bukhli. Wa na'udhu bika min ghalabat al-dayni wa qahr al-rijal. Allahumma ameen.